for us um, for us to superimpose a teleology of violence on the long and rich history of Jewish life on the territory of what is today Ukraine, uh, a history that generated a unique diversity of religious, political, and cultural contributions when we think about Jewish history. Um, a history that was marked significantly more by coexistence, coexistence between Jews and non-Jews than it was by violence. And I'm saying this not only in response to the genocidal war that Russia has launched against Ukraine, justifying it, among other things, and I'll come back to this later, by manipulating the past and demonizing Ukrainians as quintessentially violent. But also I'm saying this as a reminder, as a Jewish historian, as a reminder that we should resist a teleological view of the Jewish experience in the region, as tragic as it might have been, we should resist this teleological reading of um, Jewish history in the region, as if it was, um, you know, doomed from the very beginning, uh, enveloped in perpetual violence. Now, before I go back in time, and as you will see, I'm going to go, I'm going to shift between the present and the past. Um, I want to start with the with the present, then I'll go back to the past, and then I'll come back to the present. So you know, I hope everybody can uh, can stay with me as as we travel through time. Um, so I want to begin with a few general remarks about this horrific war of aggression that the Russian Federation has been carrying against um, Ukraine, which is, um, um, a genocide, as I said, it has, you know, um, it is genocidal. Um, the aim of this war, which has triggered, as you all know, of course, I'm just stating the obvious because I know that you all follow, you know, I'm sure that most of you follow what is happening, but it has triggered one of the worst refugee crisis in Europe since World War II with millions of Ukrainians who fled the country, who have been displaced, millions of Ukrainian children have been displaced. Um, and the, the goal of this, of this war seems to be the, the complete destruction of cities, infrastructure, homes, universities, theaters, hospitals, uh, terrorize um, indiscriminately the civilian population. Uh, many Many civilians have been abducted, have been forcibly deported to Russia. Um, and again, the aim of this war seems to be the end, putting an end to Ukrainian sovereignty and identity. Now, as a historian, one of the most painful moments, there were many painful moments, but for me, one of the most painful moments is when I when I started reading, actually, this was in April, it was rather early on, reading uh, about how um, the Russian occupiers were seizing and destroying books, um, books of history, um, Ukrainian textbooks of language, history, culture in the cities of Chernihiv, Sumy, Donetsk, Lugansk, um, in the regions of Lugansk, um, searching for books that study, you know, Ukrainian identity, Ukrainian past, Ukraine's struggle for independence. And as Jewish historians, we know all too well, or people who read about Jewish history, we know all too well what happens when a society destroys books, right? We know what happens. Uh, it's not only about destroying the past, right? It's also about destroying, you know, people. Uh, the other comment that I wanted to make, and I'm going to start sh sharing my screen, and hopefully I can be, you know, a tech savvy. I'm not always, um, uh, but hopefully I can be a uh, tech savvy. Um, is how this war has changed the 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 face of Ukrainian Jewry. Um, how it has changed its demography and its geography. Um, now, let me see if I can share uh, this. Yes, I'm, I'm doing okay, right? Everybody can see, thumbs up, Marilyn. Okay, perfect. So this is just a map of, of uh, Ukraine. I'll come back because uh, I'll come back to it in a minute. Well, actually I can start with it. Here you see Mariupol. I, I, I circled the cities that I'm mentioning right now. I'm sure that most of you have followed what happened to Mariupol, the, the, you know, where the theater was 
completely destroyed and many children were uh, and civilians of course were hiding um on uh, on the site of the theater um and uh, you know mariupol has had a, a jewish a community that was largely decimated during world war ii but not entirely i mean there was a you know a, um uh, I can't tell you exactly how many Jews uh, were members of the, the Jewish community of Mariupol before February 24th, but this is what happened to the synagogue, the building of the synagogue of Mariupol um, after Russia attacked Ukraine. And it's ironic to see this image, right, when Putin claims that by um, that by attacking Ukraine, he is actually ridding the country of Nazis, right? Uh, and But you see the result, which is the destruction of this building. Um, and here I'm showing you the historic building of the Mariupol synagogue from the 19th century. It's a rather recent, not a very old uh, Jewish community in Ukraine. There's some that are much older. Um, but, um, you know, as you can imagine, all those Jews who, 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 or most of the members of the Jewish community have left the city. Um, the same um, with the city of Kharkiv, which is, you know, to go back to uh, my map, Kharkiv is right here. Um, and I circled Kharkiv. It's, it's uh, close to the border with Russia. Um, this is this was the um, the building of the Hillel, which was a, a rather new building that had been you know, uh, sponsored by the Jewish community, also, uh, you know, abroad, and it was very, um, it was flourishing, it was, you know, attracting many students. Here you have one of the students uh, who uh, used to attend the Hillel uh, chapter, and he was killed um, uh, early on in the war. He was killed, uh, Serafim was killed in April, um, in early April. Here you have the largest Jewish community center in the world, which is located in the city of Dnipro. Today it's called Dnipro. Where's my cursor right here? Dnipopetrovsk uh, is the more Russian uh, name, but today it's called Dnipro. It's right here. Um, and th this community center has not been destroyed. Uh, has not been actually uh, affected in any way um, uh, by 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 the attack, by the bombings. Uh, but it's it's impressive that this is the largest uh, community center in the world. And here you have the synagogue in Dnipro, um, and um, and most of the Jews in the city of Dnipro, Kharkiv, Mariupol have left these these cities. And we don't know if they're going to return to these cities. So this is why I'm mentioning the fact that the war has changed the face of um, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian Jewry. Uh, here I'm just showing you this. Maybe you've seen it already. This uh, uh, it's a father and a son. Uh, the father is a, is a hostage, uh, and they both fight in um, in the Ukrainian army. But they're both you know uh, observant Jews. Um, and they are both, you know, uh, fighting to uh, to protect uh, their, uh, you know, their country. Uh, so, you know, again, the main point is that the Jews of these communities have either fled to Israel or they have resettled to the West. So this is how, you know, these communities that were, you know, rather, rather thriving, I would say, Kharkiv, Mariupol, Dnipro, uh, some Jews have moved to Kiev, but most of them have moved, as you can see here, I circled the city of Lviv and the city of Chernovtsi. So they have resettled there uh, if they have not left uh, the country entirely. And here I just wanted to show you this, this image, also the impact of this, you know, the, the destruction of the electrical po uh, power plants, um, uh, you know, and, and the lack of water in some places and heating, even in the capital city of Kiev, which of course has the largest, um, you know, Jewish community. And here I'm showing you some images of um, um, older members of the Jewish community um, in Kiev, the conservative Jewish community who are coming together and without light, uh, right, without electricity, um, but they're coming together to uh, kind of, you know, uh, to observe the Sabbath. So now this was, you know, just very quickly the present. I want to know, go, go back to the past, and I want to remind you of numbers. Um, we have 
before World War II, 1.5 million Jews lived in, uh, in what is today Ukraine. Um, the largest Jewish community was in Kyiv. Uh, 226,000 Jews lived in Kyiv, one third of the population. But I'm showing you here Berdichev. I don't know how many of you have heard the of Berdichev, which is also known as a Jewish mega shtetl. But in fact, it was a city, uh, but it was 80% of the population was Jewish. And so here you see in the background, uh, this kind of greenish building is, um, is the synagogue. Uh, there were 50,000 Jews who lived in, um, in Berdichev. Okay. And now I want to, uh, you know, really talk about the past and talk about anti-Jewish violence, because I think it's something that we need to talk about. Um, and without falling into this teleology of violence, but as a historian who recognizes the importance of studying it, um, I'd like to talk about the violence of the Russian Civil War. The epicenter of the Civil War was Ukraine. Uh, this uh, uh, Civil War took place between 1918 and 1921. And I will do that. First, I'll give you a sense of the Civil War, and then I will zoom in on one voice, one woman. Um, she was a writer, and she was very, um, uh, she produced very powerful accounts of this violence. Her name is Rocco Feigenberg. I will show you a slide later with, with the name in case you're interested in her. Um, and then uh, once I talk about this violence, I'm going to go back to, well, talk a little bit about the memory of this violence, and then I will conclude with some contemporary, with some thoughts about contemporary Ukraine. Um, Okay, so let me go over the nuts and bolts of the events in Ukraine, 1918 to 1921. In the wake of World War I and shortly after the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, we have a violent war that erupts in the eastern territories of the European continent, present day Ukraine, but also in, in Belarus and in southern Russia, between different armies and forces that represent different geopolitical uh, goals. The Ukrainian armed forces fight against the Red Army, against Soviet power, and they want independence. They're fighting for independ the independence of the Ukrainian People's Republic, which is established in December 1917. The Red Army is waging a war for the victory of Bolshevism and is trying to control the territory of the former Tsarist Empire, which includes Ukraine. And then you have other enemies of Soviet power, which include different armed formations. Uh, you have the white movement, the political and territorial goal of the white troops is the return of the Tsar, the return of autocracy to the Tsarist empire and the defeat of Bolshevism. And then you have the Polish troops that are fighting for um, they're fighting on behalf of the Second Polish Republic. They're fighting against the Red Army. They want to maintain their uh, independence. And, you know, this chapter is known as the Polish-Soviet War. And then, of course, you have, um, in addition uh, to the military forces involved, you have a diverse group of anarchist peasant bands and thousands of civilians who join the fighting. Um, most often they're swayed by the desperate socioeconomic conditions of war, famine um, in the region and World War I since 1914. Um, and they're responding to this appeal of looting. Uh, so they're driven very often more by despair than by political allegiance. Now, most troops and military units involved in the conflict perpetrated atrocities against the Jewish population. And the pogrom, this, you know, uh, ethnic violence against Jews, became unprecedented both in nature and in scale. And I'm showing you here some quotes. Um, the pogroms were both military, but they also included the participation of neighbors as war, famine, a shortage of food led neighbors to turn against neighbors and participate in the looting and killing of Jewish, uh, of their Jewish neighbors. You have approximately 1,500 pogroms that were carried out in more than 800 towns and shtetls. Uh, 
uh, most of them located in Ukraine. As many as 150,000 Jews die as a result of this violence. And the motivation for the violence vastly differed. Uh, again, as I said, desperate conditions of war encouraged soldiers and uh, local peasants to loot Jewish communities. For many um, political and military leaders on all sides, this, there was a stereotype of Jewish disloyalty towards the Ukrainian dream of, of nationhood and independence, uh, towards, you know, Polish, the Polish uh, nation state or the Russian version of this revitalized empire. And this all intersected with this, you know, exclusivist nationalism that uh, peaks during World War I and with the fear of Bolshevism. And Jews are thought of as these interlopers in the national body of these, um, you know, of, of the Poles, Ukrainians, or Russians, and are imagined as forces connected to Bolshevism and that tear apart the, the nation's fabric. Um, and of course, in many ways, this constitutes um, a continuation of pre-1917 SARS rhetoric on Jewish radicalism. Now, Ukraine is the main, is the center stage, the main stage of the battlefront. Here, where all forces clash in combat and where one of the largest Jewish communities in Europe had lived and thrived for centuries. Now, to be sure, anti-Jewish violence had disrupted the lives, and I mentioned it earlier in my remarks, in my opening remarks, had disrupted the lives of Jews living in the cities and towns of Ukraine time and again since the 17th century. Historically, the violence occurred on the backdrop of political upheaval and socioeconomic tensions and was reinforced by pre-existing class tensions and religious stereotypes. But it often found its main source in the divergence between Jewish and Ukrainian political strategies and goals. Jews were a despised minority and could not create their own army. So what did they do? They look for protection. They needed protection and sought it from the existing power, usually the nobility, the king. And they forged what historian Yosef Yerushalmi has called the royal alliance, right? So they side with the highest authority, which promised protection. Um, and this became the Jewish community's survival strategy. Um, however, this alliance between Jews and the centers of power was very often at odds with Ukrainians' political goals. Ukrainians created armies and fought for independence against these centers of power. So the lack of common political goals fostered these horizontal tensions and clashes between Jews and their neighbors, yielding some tragic consequences. Uh, during 1648, you have the Cossack uprising against Polish rule in Ukraine, and Bogdan Khmelnytsky's forces um, carried out anti-Jewish massacres, primarily because they identified Jews as allies, as allies of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, and enemies of the Cossacks. The same political dynamic that pitted Jewish and Ukrainian political objectives each other against each other was at play one century later during the 1768 rebellion of Ukrainian peasants and Cossacks against, again, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth led by Ivan Honta, and I'm showing you here an image, who headed the massacre of thousands of Jews in Uman, um, in retaliation, again, for their alliance with the Polish forces. So these real or imagined divergent political interests promoted resentment, encouraged violence against Jewish communities during the, pogrom, the later pogroms in the 1880s and early 1900s, many of which took place in um, Ukraine. But it was really the Russian civil war that I just told you about that brought these differences to the fore in a new and critical way. Um, the roughly 1.5 million Jews who lived on the territories of Ukraine on the eve of World War I were not merely passive victims of violence, right? Many, especially the younger ones who became politicized through 
Zionism or socialism took sides during the war. To some extent, Jews participated on all sides of the conflict, uh, with some very few, however, even joining the white army led by General Denikin. Uh, by and large, at least at the beginning of the conflict, I would say, many Jews chose to support the Ukrainian national movement against Soviet power. And many young Zionist and Bundist activists selected to fight on behalf of Ukraine, on behalf of the Central Rada of Ukraine, the political body of the Ukraine's uh, polit uh, People's Republic that existed from 1917 to 1918. But everything changes in 1919 um, as the violence against the Jewish population intensifies. More and more communal leaders and political activists shift their allegiance and seek the protection from the Red Army, from Soviet power, which killed less Jews than other armies, or actually stopped killing them altogether by, by the end of 1918, as even the staunchest anti-Bolsheviks turned into supporters of Soviet power, and often their choice was the lesser of two evils. As you can see here from the slide that I'm showing you, it was a reluctant choice to side with the Reds, but it still prompted a vicious circle or a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? The more they supported the Reds, the Jews, the more the Jews supported the Reds, the more Ukrainian forces that were led by Simon Petliura, and I'll show you an image of him later, um, came to resent Jews for this alleged lack of loyalty to Ukraine and pro-communist position carrying out many pogroms. The fact that there were rumors of Bolsheviks uh, led by Jewish socialists and anti-Semitic stereotypes uh, reinforce this. The fact that Leon Trotsky, and you can see here some anti-communist caricature that was produced at the time, the fact that Trotsky was the leader of the Red Army did not play in favor of the Jews, who came again to be identified as this compromised political actor. And the success with which the white forces in particular weaponized the discourse of Jewish communism, of Judeo-Bolshevism, and you, again, these, these two posters are an example of that, through systematic propaganda, influence Ukrainian troops and neighbors into seeing Jews as a threat to you, the Ukrainian dream of independence. So the more Pitlyura, the leader of Ukraine, resorted to this kind of pogrom politics which was this tactic to bond the troops against a common enemy to struggle against Bolshevik forces, the more Jews who had championed the Ukrainian forces uh, and the idea of independent Ukraine embraced the Red Army, uh, some grudgingly, some enthusiastically, but you see that it's, it's almost an impossible situation. Anyway, I got drawn into this chaos the epicenter of which is Ukraine, um, by this writer, Rojo Feigenberg, Rachel Feigenberg, um, in a way I hold her responsible. And I thought that I would talk a little bit about her and her work. She's, you know, uh, she's largely a marginal voice today, especially when we think about the study of anti-Jewish violence, but she's a central voice at the time of the events. Um, in fact, it wasn't by chance that the great historian of Ukrainian Jewry at the time, and I'm showing you here an image of him, Elias Cherikover, he actually turned to her at the time of the pogroms. Um, he said, you know, he gave her an assignment to write reports about the destruction of small Jewish settlements, some of which were completely wiped off the map of Ukraine. Conscious of the fact that unlike previous waves of anti-Jewish violence during the Civil War, the Ukrainian shtetl became the epicenter of the pogrom. And this was an assignment that Rojo Feigenberg took very seriously. Also as a result of the fact that she herself experienced 
the violence. And I'm showing her here with her newborn son with whom she managed to flee to go into hiding uh, during the pogroms of the Civil War. So in 1922, actually, after uh, Cherikov left Ukraine, you know, he collects these accounts about the pogroms, then he flees uh, with the documents to Berlin. Um, in 1922, uh, Cherikov receives the accounts that this woman, that Rocco Feigenberg, wrote. Um, and he adds her account to the thousands of original records, testimonies, photographs of these uh, bloody uh, pogroms. And um, what, what he receives is this. This is uh, the account of the destruction of one shtetl, the shtetl of Dubove, Dubovo. You see, uh, you see it right here that she wrote. Um, this she wrote, the title of this is um, in English, Chronicle of a Dead, the Destruction of Dubove, Chronicle of a Dead City. Um, and it is based on um, interviews with refugees that she met in Odessa. And here you can read what she says. You know, after she flees, she manages to leave her shtetl. She, she reaches Odessa. And here she interviews uh, Jewish refugees who also experience this violence. And based on these interviews, uh, she wrote the accounts that she then sent to uh, Cherikov. And this account that she wrote, that I, sh I just showed you here, this is the archival um, uh, document that she put together. Um, um, she sent it to, I'm sorry, let me stay on this, uh, on this, actually on this one. Um, she sent it to, um, uh, to Berlin, but it's so powerful that it was used um, during the sensational Schwarzbard murder trial in Paris in 1927. Um, for those of you who don't know about this trial, this is when the young Ukrainian Jew Sholem Schwarzbad assassinated Pitlura in revenge for the, the pogrom. Pitlura, again, is the leader of the Ukrainian forces, and he assassinated him in Paris. Pitlura had fled the Soviet Union. He had fled to Paris. Schwarzbad is in Paris, and he assassinates him, and there's this big trial um, that was extensively covered, uh, even by the New York Times, by the way. And um, and during the trial, the account that Feigenberg wrote was used um, and was even translated into French. Uh, and eventually, Sholem uh, Schwarzbart is acquitted. Although he did, he you know he does not apologize. He says, "I did kill Petlura because of the pogroms." Anyway, her voice and um, uh, uh, of, of Rocco Feigenberg uh, really allows us to grasp some of the aspects of this violence that took place uh, on the territory of Ukraine. Um, she helps us uh, expand our understanding of the human dimension of these pogroms. What I'm showing you here is the book that was published in 1926 based on her account. Uh, it has the same title as the archival, um, as the original uh, document. And um, she focuses, for example, on the Jewish home, what happened to the Jewish home at the time of these programs, on how violence influences everyday life and how it, it, it really changed the, um, the, um, the, the, the neighborly relations um, and how it also reshaped the future life choices of many uh, of, um, of the victims. Um, it was also translated into Russian in 1928, um, and it is a very, very powerful uh, account. Um, she also reminds us um, in this, and I'm, I'm actually going to leave you with this, uh, with this um, the photograph of what is left of the shtetl of Dubove, uh, actually of the Jewish cemetery, which was after the Jewish population was killed, it was completely destroyed. Um, but in this account, she reminds us how the homes um, of non-Jewish neighbors 
could also offer refuge and, protect, and protection during these pogroms. After all, as I mentioned earlier, it was coexistence and not violence that had been the constant marker of relations between Jews and non-Jews in any town of Ukraine over the centuries. So these stories of cooperation and suspension of violence are not always easy to recover. More often than not, witness accounts and survivor testimonies tend to focus on the details of betrayal, right? Um, on those on those neighbors who took part in the looting and the killing, understandably so, rather than on the instances in which neighbors provided assistance um, to, uh, to their Jewish neighbors during the pogroms. Of course, the trauma of death and loss could skew the memory of the experience of the pogroms, inspiring victims to remember or to report only those instances in which they were denied refuge by their neighbors and maybe forget or choose to silence those cases in which the home of strangers became a site of rescue. Cellars or attics became spaces of shelter. And she does mention these cases. Um, now, Feigenberg, as I, uh, as I mentioned, um, um, records her own journey as she fled the violence, uh, as she fled in haste. Actually, let me go back to this slide where she is with her son. Um, and she manages to flee thanks to the neighbors. Uh, she, um, she survived thanks to peasants in nearby villages who took her into her and her newborn son into their homes. She does not describe these homes and does not reveal the peasants' identities, perhaps because at the time she perceived their behavior as exceptional. But she acknowledged, for example, one woman who saved her by helping her mask her Jewish identity. This woman gave her a traditional folk dress and a little cross to put around her child's neck to disguise him as a Christian boy. So in a way, the woman who provided assistance to Feigenberg did so by bequeathing her with a piece of her home, right? We can assume that the dress and the cross were not only closely connected to her ethno-national identity, but also to the history and memory of her home. So these were personal items that were shared with a Jewish woman and her son. Um, and in turn, in order to save herself and her son, Feigenberg took with her a piece of the woman's home. So this is an example, I think, of coexistence. Um, Feigenberg's powerful accounts of anti-Jewish violence uh, in Ukraine at the time also confirmed the role the gender played in dictating the suspension of violence. It was much easier for women to um, find a refuge in um in in the homes of their neighbors neighbors often uh, offered support and care um to women and children more than to jewish men uh, so it's much easier to hide uh, just like you know it was uh, to some degree during the holocaust it was easier to hide hide among neighbors disguising one's identity in order to escape the violence uh for jewish women than it was for men um, in the Shtetl of Dubove, for example, she mentions a Ukrainian neighbor who offered refuge to many Jewish women and children. Um, and um, in exchange for, um, for personal objects, uh, a value, um, but many widows and orphans took, um, took refuge, found refuge uh, in his home. And as one refugee interviewed by Feigenberg noted, his home became an exhibit of Jewish furniture and objects, meaning that in exchange for that, he gave them refuge. And the Dubove peasants called him the Jewish father, uh, a Jewish bachko, the Jewish father. Um, the, the, the last point that I want to make is that the, this chronicle by Feigenberg also sheds light on some of the choices that Jews made in response to the pogroms. Witnessing and experiencing the violence had long-term consequences for generations of younger Jews who lived in Ukraine, 
um, galvanizing some political choices spanning from communism to Zionism, and in some cases triggered the desire for revenge. Um, in others, they influenced the relations with the local population um, and with state authority. Um, in, in many cases, it, it really triggered uh, migration from the smaller shtetls to the larger cities, like in this case, you know, from Dubova to uh, Odessa or to Kiev, but also to Moscow and to uh, Petrograd, or which would become uh, Leningrad, but also external migration, Europe, America, Palestine. One survivor in the Dubova uh, massacre, his name is Moshe Schwarzman, um, refused to remain in Dubove, although many of his neighbors wanted him to stay because he was um, he was the most um, uh, skilled wheelwright. So they wanted him to stay, but he said, I cannot stay. Um, I want to move to Odessa, uh, where uh, Russians and Ukrainians will be ashamed to carry out pogroms. This is, you know, this is, I'm quoting from uh, Feigenberg. Um, when Feigenberg uh, survived her near-to-death um, experience of, of, uh, of the pogroms and she fled to Odessa, she, and she wrote about her small town home in the shtetl where she lived, um, a space that she remembered uh, warmly with, with nostalgia. This was a space where she prepared the food for the Jewish holidays, uh, where she marinated the squash and the pickles and the tomatoes. Um, but she, you know, um, she could not return to this space, the space that marked, that was marked by the quotidian, uh, that was connected to the preparation of food. Um, she could not return to it because it was completely destroyed. Her home was destroyed. The home was demolished. Um, so she would not return to the shtetl, she would not move to a larger city in Ukraine like Odessa, she would not move to Moscow. She, together with thousands of others, actually reached the Romanian uh, border and then moved to uh, Poland. And then from Poland, she reached Palestine. But she did not relinquish the memory of these pogroms. Actually, this memory resurfaced with renewed power during World War II. And I'm showing you here she herself translated into Hebrew. You know, she, she moved to Palestine. Uh, she switched from Yiddish to Hebrew and she translated these accounts of the programs of the Civil War into Hebrew um, in 1940 and in 1943 and eventually published a book later uh, after World War II about these accounts. Okay. Um, let me now dwell on the question of um, this politics of memory. And, um, and I want to say um, that there are continuities between Russia's distortion of history and the Soviet politics of memory with regard to the memory of this violence that I just described and detailed um, for you. Um, and this is a reminder I'm saying this as a reminder of a deep ambivalence that the Soviet state had towards anti-Semitism and towards condemning anti-Semitism, which is connected to what Putin is doing today, I would say. While the state condemned on paper anti-Semitism, um, it was often eager to ignore anti-Semitism or to weaponize it in its best interest. So with regard to the programs that I just described, the Soviets shifted between acknowledging and downplaying anti-Jewish violence. And they were ambiguous in their treatment of the perpetrators, creating a state-controlled um, memory and narrative. So here I'm showing you Trostinets, which is near the city of Vinitsa, a small shtetl. You see uh, how it was, uh, you know, destroyed during the pogroms. Um, and here I'm showing you a memorial. This is a memorial that the Soviet state put up um, after it liberated the shtetl from uh, Ukrainian forces. Um, 
And the inscription is very interesting. You can maybe see how on the right-hand side, it's in Yiddish and on the, um, on the left-hand side, it's in Russian. And it reads very clearly, here rest 337 Jews of Trostinets who were brutally murdered in May, 1919 by the enemies of the Soviet state. So the message conveyed to anyone who passed by this memorial was very clear. The Soviet state commemorated, remembered, and guarded Jews against anti-Jewish violence and knew very well who the enemies were, right? Ukrainians. Now, when the discussion of the pogroms, and here you see how immense this memorial is, when the discussion of the pogroms was perceived at, as at odds with the regime's interest and priorities of building socialism based on the brotherhood of peoples, then the memory of anti-Jewish violence was silenced. Victims are universalized and the Soviets preferred not to investigate and punish the perpetrators. We have many trials uh, in 1923, 1924 of those who carried out this violence who are either not punished in the end or whose crimes of killing Jews are not mentioned in the verdicts. So this is very, this tendency to kind of uh, downplay the importance of this violence on the part of the state. On the other hand, the Soviet state could use these pogroms and the memory of these pogroms to advance its own interests. One of these interests being countering Ukrainian nationalism or Ukraine's desire for independence, identifying it as a national threat for the Soviet Union. So for example, at the time, oh, actually I wanted to show you also the image of this memorial that still stands today. Um, and you can see how, how big it is. Um, this is Simon Pitlura. So an example of um, you know of this of, of the way in which the Soviet state exploits exploited this memory at the time of the 1926 trial uh, against Sholem Schwarzbad that I mentioned earlier, uh, who assassinated Pitlura, who you see here. Um, 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 at this time, um, and again, Petlur had moved to Paris where he, he was uh, the leader of the Ukrainian government in exile. Uh, when Schwarzbad uh, commits, um, you know, uh, carries out this act of uh, uh, assassinates Petlura, the, the Soviet press wildly covers the events and collects documents to prove um, Pitlura's responsibility for the pogroms uh, and sends these documents to Paris to use as evidence in the trial. Um, and, um, and as I said, this, this, this trial is covered extensively in the Soviet press. Here, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm showing you as an example, uh, Schwarz, but is this um, the man at, at the center with the, um, uh, with the mustache? Um, but the state also used this trial as a pretext to carry out systematic campaign against Ukrainian nationalism and its leaders. This campaign reemerges with force in 1929 when the secret police, the Soviet secret police, arrested the members of the underground Ukrainian um, uh, organizations for con allegedly cons conspiring against the Soviet Union on behalf of uh, Ukrainian independence. So the preoccupation with Pitlura was ideologically straightforward and allowed the Soviets to accomplish their objective, which was it confirmed the wickedness of the political enemy embodied by Ukrainian nationalism, allowing them to purge Ukrainians um, in Soviet Ukraine, um, including people that had nothing to do with Pitlura, um, and that had not supported Pitlura and that had not carried out any kind of violence. Let me move to present day, uh, to the present day. Um, and I think, um, and you know, let us think about the memory of these pogroms and anti-Jewish violence uh, today. Now, without doubt, the war uh, launched by Russia against Ukraine that, as most of you know, goes back to 
2014, um, unleashed, understandably, this wave of nationalist sentiment. Um, you have, um, in many uh, places across Ukraine, the renaming of streets uh, and even memorial events for Pitlura. Here you see this um, this mural um, in um, in the city of uh, Vinitsa. So there is a kind of a public rehabilitation of Pitlura. Um, in 2016, for the first time, the country observed a minute of silence in memory of Pitlura to mark the 90th anniversary of Pitlura's assassination in Paris that I talked about earlier. Um, and again, as a freedom fighter for the Ukrainian people, Pitlura is generally not held accountable for anti-Jewish violence. Uh, he is, um, you know, he's remembered as someone who fight, who fought against Soviet power, not as someone who uh, also is responsible for uh, anti-Jewish violence. So it's definitely very complicated. And certainly, you know, in general, glorification, glorifying, um, uh, you know, a hero rarely fits together with vilifying the hero, right? In, in national histories, in national memories, glorification and vilification never go together, right? Uh, meaning that the identity of a hero rarely conflates with that of a perpetrator. Um, in 2005, on the initiative of Putin, the remains of, here I'm showing you again another, uh, you know, statue of um, Pitlura. But in, in 2005, on the initiative of Putin, the remains of General Anton Denikin, who was responsible for some of the most brutal pogroms against Jews during the civil war on Ukrainian territory. General Denikin, as I mentioned earlier, is the leader of the white movement. Um, so on the initiative of Putin, the remains of the general were returned to Moscow and buried in the cemetery of the Donskoy Monastery, which is one of the most uh, important sites in terms of, you know, memory of heroes um, in the Russian Federation. And Putin laid flowers on the Moscow grave of the white Russian leader um, in 2009 and sanctioned him as a symbol of the indivisibility of, um, of Russia, confirming a trend of, um, a trend to glorify the past through the restoration of this forgotten national hero who was uh, a pogromchik, who carried out pogroms. And um, so the pogromist uh, Denikin is turned into a national hero and into the guardian of, uh, of Russian patriotism. Um, Marilyn, do I still have a few minutes? Um, uh, we, or should I, should I stop? Uh, we have about two minutes left. Uh, two minutes so if left. Wrap Excellent. Things up, that Excellent. would be great. Wonderful. Two minutes left. Here, by the way, I'm showing you. Um, this is from the Pew Research Center in terms, again, of um of uh you know you've heard you've all heard of the way in which putin and the russian federation have exploited this idea of uh you know anti-semitic denazifying the, their goal is to denazify ukraine um uh, ukraine as the center of anti-semitism and you can see here you can compare the percentage of um of anti-semitism um in in different countries in europe so, um, you know, to conclude, um, and I don't want to, you know, um, I don't want to get into too many details, but um, of, of the present day situation, but I would say that, um, I would say that after the collapse of the Soviet Union in general, Ukraine, you know, has become the most democratic state in the post Soviet landscape, if we, you know, without considering Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, without considering the Baltic states, it has become the most, you know, with all its problems in terms of corruption and so on, it has become the most 
um, you know, the most successful um, uh, post-Soviet democratic state. Um, and, um, and I would say that it has also begun to witness a new chapter in um, in uh, Ukrainian Jewish relations. Uh, you know, I won't uh, state the obvious, the fact that we have a Jewish president um, who was elected with 70, almost 73% of the votes, which, which is extraordinary and unthinkable in any other country in Eastern Europe. In Poland, impossible. In the Baltic states, impossible. In Russia, let's not even begin. Uh, in, in many other countries in Europe. So it's very interesting um, that there's this new this new chapter. Thanks to him, there also is a law against anti-Semitism now in Ukraine. This law passed uh, after he was elected. Um, <clears throat> there is also this, you know, this new complex that is being finally created at the site of Babi Yar, um, um, where more than 33,000 Jews were killed in uh, 1941 by the Germans and their collaborators during uh, World War II. Um, so I think that there's, you know, I am um, cautiously optimistic. Well, I, I would say I am optimistic that, um, um, you know, that, also, as um, as a Jewish historian, I feel very comfortable saying that I support um, Ukraine today, despite the violence that I just described to you, that I'm not silencing or marginalizing, marginalizing in any way, uh, but that I support Ukraine today. Um, and my support of Ukraine does not mean that I'm dismissing these dark pages um, in um, in the past of, um, you know, in, in, in the relations between Jews and Ukrainians in the past. And I just want to close with, um, I want to leave you with the words of my favorite writer, uh, Vasily Grossman, who's a Ukrainian uh, born. He was born in Berdichev. Remember, I showed you the image of the mega shtetl uh, earlier. Um, he's a wonderful writer. You see him here on the left-hand side with his mother, who was killed by the Germans uh, in Berdichev in 1941. Uh, he survived the war. He wrote about the war. He wrote about the Holocaust. And um, and uh, he, he wrote a lot about the totalitarian system. And I want to leave us with the words of Vasily Grossman, um, who asks us in his uh, magisterial novel, which is called Life and Fate, that if you haven't read, I would um, uh, highly recommend it. Um, he asks us, what is, you know, what is his solution in the totalitarian regime? And he suggests that to witness and to speak the truth to power, to resist the state's language, to wrest language away from the regime is to resist the dehumanizing aspects of totalitarian control as Russia is moving toward totalitarian fascist leadership. I think it is our responsibility to follow, um, to listen to the words of Vasily Grossman, a Ukrainian Jew who witnessed um, and paid the price of uh, of, uh, you know, of, of experiencing his life um, in, um, in, you know, in the totalitarian system. Uh, he says that we must, um, we must speak truth to power. And so um, it is, you know, I feel at least that it's my responsibility as a Jewish historian to, uh, to, to speak uh, truth to power and, and, uh, and resist and reject um, this this um, imagined truth, this artificial truth that is not truth uh, that uh, the Russian Federation is, um, you know, has been forging, has been putting together in order to justify this war. And on that note, I, I finished. Um, I, I I completed my uh, my 